welcome everybody uh, to uh, what we've been to the Law Center for Muslim Christian Understanding and our book talk by Dr. Aaron Rocksinger on his new book on Salafism, much, much heralded and already well uh, received book. Um, Dr. Rocksinger is a historian of the modern Middle East at University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. With a research focus on 20th century Islamic movements and states, he received his BA at the University of Pennsylvania and his MPhil at Oxford and his PhD at Princeton University. Uh, his first book, Practicing Islam in Egypt, Print Media and Islamic Revival from Cambridge in 2019, he drew on ideologically diverse Islamic magazines from this period to chart the rise of Islamic revival in 1970s Egypt, within a larger global story of religious consultation, contestation and change. And today he'll be talking to us about his second book, uh, which I'm very eager to hear about. And I was sort of sitting there saying, you know, boy, he's written some good books with great presses, but you know, I bet you he's not that good a professor. But then I just saw yesterday he got a teaching award. So now I, we have no, we know he's like a double threat. What do you call these in sports? Like uh, someone triple can, threat. What, are they, what does that mean they can do? What well, sport is that? I think baseball, I think it would be home runs. Well, a double threat would be home runs and steals, I think. Okay, yeah. So you're one of those things. You're one of the, you're at least a double threat, maybe a triple threat. Oh, we see your service. He's also on a lot of committees. <laughs> okay. So uh, Aaron, the floor is yours. Please proceed. All righty. So I am. Oh, wait, sorry. Uh, sorry. One more thing. I just want to say, I forgot. Sorry. The questions are going to be in the Q&A box only we're not going to be taking you know voice questions so if you have questions ask them in the q a function and we'll get to them later sorry go ahead Aaron. all right so i'm gonna share my slide once my slides one second um all righty you can see the slideshow yep all right excellent um so let me begin by saying how thrilled i am to be at georgetown virtually um I'm really grateful, Jonathan, for you making this visit possible and for all of the folks at Georgetown um, who did all of the logistics um, to make this all work today. Um, now, I should begin by telling a little story, which is that back in the early 2010, so really you know, 2010, 2011, I came across the term gender mixing as I was doing my dissertation research on the rise of an Islamic revival in 1970s Egypt. Now, based on what I'd read about Salafism, I assumed A, that this term came from Salafism and B, that it was a pretty long-standing principle. Uh, as is often the case, you have an assumption, you need to double check it, and then it leads um, you down a very, very, very deep tunnel. Um, and what I discovered is that it's not simply that gender segregation um, did not go back uh, to a significant degree in Islamic history, but that Salafis didn't formulate a clear principle of gender segregation until the 1970s. Um, and this got me interested in the broader question of Salafism and the specific question of how we might rethink Salafism in terms of a history of distinctly Salafi social practices. Now, on my slide, you can see the cover image of this book, which comes from a 1980 pamphlet, which features prominently in chapter four of my book, uh, which focuses on gender segregation. Now, this pamphlet is entitled The Flaunting and the Dangers of Women Joining Men in Their Workplace. And, but it was not initially published as a pamphlet, but instead as a series of articles in Salafi and Islamist periodicals in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait. This pamphlet is the work of a leading Saudi Salafi scholar, Abdelaziz bin Baz. Now this particular version of the pamphlet, uh, which was produced by a now defunct Egyptian publishing house, Maktabat al-Salam, is unusual among editions of this text and of Salafi texts more broadly in this period, which generally eschew depictions of men, let alone women. The cover depicts a faceless yet alluring brunette clad in a cloak in the background and a glass and wine bottle along with a deck of cards in the foreground. 
This image offers a vivid depiction of Salafism's concern with visibility, which is a key theme of our talk today, and its focus on regulating public behavior. It also summons effective responses that range from enthusiastic agreement, the presume intended reaction, to anger among those who oppose the Salafi social practice. Project, excuse me. If a picture is worth a thousand words, this illustration reflects how Salafi scholars came to articulate a public vision of piety premised on the linkage, and here this is going to be a point I repeat, the linkage between ethics and visible practice. Today, I'm not going to be telling a story of gender segregation, but instead one of the emergence of a distinctly Salafi beard. I wanna begin with the basics of our story. In the 1980s, Egyptian Salafi elites, in conversation with like-minded scholars from the Levant to the Persian Gulf, came to a consensus regarding a seemingly secondary legal question, citing the precedent of the first three generations of the Muslim community, of Salaf al-Salah, of pious ancestors. These scholars declared that the properly Islamic beard must reach a minimal length of a fist and the kabda and be paired with a trimmed mustache. Now, the fact that Salafis reached this particular endpoint is, on the surface, utterly unsurprising. There's little dispute that the Prophet Muhammad wore a beard, and the length of the fist is an easily accessible measurement in the Hadith corpus that then forms a basis for much of the legal literature. It would thus be easy to assume that Salafism's interpretive approach to Islamic law, distinguished by a normative commitment to exclusive reliance on the Quran and the Sunnah, led in linear fashion to a particular legal position. One might also dismiss the beard as a marginal concern. After all, Salafis are best known for their commitment to theological rectitude, legal methodology, and ritual precision. Yet many Salafis took a very different view of the beard. As a preacher in Egypt's leading Salafi organization, Ansar al-Sunnah al-Muhammadiyah declared, in, in 1988, the beard serves as a noble announcement to society, to introduce society, excuse me, to what it means to be Sunni. So the beard raises as many questions as it answers. First, why does the beard, rather than, for example, the transmission of particular theological or legal positions or access to state power, serve as a central means to introduce Salafi understandings of Sunnism to Egyptian society. Second, if Salafism begins in the 1920s, the leading Salafi organization in Egypt, Ansar Sunnah, is established in 1926 and possessed a clear interpretive approach, why did it take over half a century for the organization's elites to articulate a defined model of facial hair? It should have been obvious, right? And finally, what should we make of this Ansar as sunnah author by the name of Ahmad Taha Nasser, describing the beard's communicative function and its role in shaping society? So there are many debates that have raged over definitions among scholars of Salafism. And in this respect, I find Henri Lozier's work to be most persuasive. But still, even with Henri's work, there's a question not merely of the concept of Salafia as referring to neo hanbali theology and deriving all law from the Quran and Sunnah, but what does it mean to be Salafi in practice? How do Salafis shape the society in which they live? And how are they shaped by these societies? More broadly, the study of Salafism, at this point a pretty significant topic in the academic literature, has a few broad emphases. First, it privileges the political. It focuses on Salafis who engage in electoral politics. Second, it carries a certain implicit assumption that Salafis are, as they claim to be, reproducing a prophetic paradigm. There's little attempt to historicize the reproduction of the prophetic paradigm as a distinctly 20th century religio-political project. Now, more broadly, there's also a question of how to study Islamic piety. To what extent does the discursive tradition approach introduced by Talal Assad and popularized in the study of the anthropology of Islam 
by scholars such as Sabah Mahmoud and Charles Hirschkind, um, explain Salafism. To what extent is it insufficient or problematic? And on this last point, I'm happy to get into this more in Q&A. Now to come back to a key theme of my talk, most fundamentally, I understand Salafism as a movement whose core logic is shaped by the questions and concerns of modernity, even as its core claim to legitimacy derives from a claim to continuity with early Islamic history. Now, the question then for me became, how can I write such a story? I was at this point well on my way to distinguish my, distinguishing myself as the oddball in the field of Salafism studies who was really interested in Salafi social practice. To, to write a project like this, to tell a story of this sort, I needed to draw on a wide range of sources, not just multi-volume legal texts, but also pamphlets and periodicals. With the pamphlets and periodicals, really giving me a granular sense of how these ideas develop over time and how they develop in competition and conversation with ideological competitors, particularly other Islamic movements. I also needed to make a transnational move because while this book is focused on Egypt, ultimately one couldn't tell the story of Salafism in Egypt divorced from a broader transnational set of networks and ideas. And so as a result, I focus in this book, not just on Egypt, but also draw on work produced in Syria, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Yemen. Now in this book, I tell the story of the emergence of four distinctive practices of purist Salafism, which emerged between the 1930s and the 1990s. The first is praying in shoes, the second, gender segregation, the third, the fist length beard, paired with a trimmed mustache, and the fourth, the prohibition against letting one's robe or pants hang down, known as ispel. I also trace how these practices emerge within an expanded understanding of worship, or ebeda, that, while partially derived from Ibn Taymiyyah's definition of this term, is equally shaped by a concept of custom derived from secular nationalism. Today, however, I'll be focusing on one of those practices, the beard, and what it can reveal about the emergence of Salafism as a social movement that makes a linkage between ethics and visible performance. Put differently, one cannot be a Salafi without being seen to be a Salafi. One needs to be seen to live this model. The question, of course, is where this practice of the fist length beard comes from, and just as importantly, what the source of its basic logic is. And in telling this story, I will focus in particular on Egypt's leading Salafi organization, Ansar Asunna al-Muhammadiyah. So my talk today will be focusing on the 1980s and how during this period, Salafis came to articulate a distinct vision of facial hair. Specifically, I will argue in the, in the 1980s, Salafis appropriated a set of madhab-based deliberations in an attempt to form a model of social hair that could be recognized as not simply Sunnaic, but as distinctly Salafi. Part and parcel of a sustained effort to define the practices of a broader social movement through active reconstruction of early Islamic history, this project aimed to enable its members to lay claim to authenticity based on continuity with Islam's founding moment, and to distinguish Egyptian Salafis in particular from student activists and jihadi groups alike who all sported bushy beards. Before I get to the 1980s, however, or to the history of the beard more broadly, I want to foreground the analytical turn that I'm making away from the existing scholarship on Islamic piety and the scholarship on Salafism alike. My argument is that the story of the beard is not one of a discursive Islamic ethical tradition along the lines of Mahmoud or Hirschkind, nor is it one of the Salafis drawing on the regulative logic of pre-modern models of piety or ethics. Instead, my argument is that the basic model, uh, the basic logic of the Salafi beard is distinctly modern and has far more to do with 19th century understandings of self-regulating subjects and modernizing states than it does with either a pre-modern Islamic tradition or a discursive Islamic ethical tradition. 
Now, in this book more broadly, I argue that the Salafi linkage of ethics and visibility is a direct conceptual descendant of a distinctly modern project of subject formation, and that and in that context, a particular linkage between appearance and allegiance that is that was propagated by modernizing states. And here my argument relies on key points about the 19th century and modernization, most prominently the works by individuals such as Timothy Mitchell and Khaled Fahmi. Now, our basic story here is that in the 19th century, the modern Egyptian state emerged, establishing complex bureaucratic institutions and laid claim to increasing, if incomplete, control over the population. What is particularly significant to the story of Salafism is how these modernization efforts regulated individual practice. In particular, in the context of the modernization effort, uniforms served to distinguish various ranks of soldiers within the army, as well as to distinguish the army from the general population. This reflected the intersection of hierarchy and communication in a, in a system that sought to anonymize its constituent members. Similarly, students in state institutions were expected to don distinct uniforms, including a dark blue shirt with a single row of buttons, bright red trousers, badges attached to the collar's front, and a tarbouche on the head. The regulation of dress in this context thus reflected not only the emergence of state-sponsored projects of subject formation, but also a linkage between clothing and allegiance to an abstract entity here, institutions controlled by the Ottoman Egyptian state. This story of subject formation, of course, would also be incomplete without account accounting for the role of colonial influence. As Timothy Mitchell has argued, British colonial rule introduced a new system of visual representation to Egypt and sought to reorganize society, as well as new notions of political and textual authority. Of particular significance to the calls to piety that followed, however, was the idea of the governance of the self, siesta avetia, expressed in terms of hygiene, education, and discipline. In short, by the end of the 19th century, a model of subjectivity premised on observable and generally visible modes of self regulation had been established. Now, there's much more. To be of a story to be told here on the relationship between modernization, the emergence of mass politics and media. And here I'm particularly indebted to the work of not only Khaled uh, and Tim Mitchell, but also Aaron Jakes and Ziad Fahmi. But in this talk, I'm going to jump ahead to the contestations of the interwar period, focusing on the linkage between ethics and visibility in the, in the service of particular ideological ends. During this period, uniforms were central to ideologically diverse social movements, whether the blue shirts of the Waft, the green shirts of the Young Egypt Proud Party, or more broadly, the aspiring members of the Egyptian middle class, middle strata known as the Effendia, who donned the suit and tarbouche. In all cases, visibility was not merely a manifestation of an internal ethical position, but was central to it. To put it most simply, being seen was central to being. What I am doing here, obviously, is not telling an exhaustive history, but rather making the point that these 19th century projects are adopted and persist among ideologically varied social movements in the interwar period. Now, this brings us to what you thought you were getting when you logged on to this talk, what you expected to be hearing about Salafi a story of how Salafis came to adopt distinct social practice, practices and how these practices link between ethics and visibility. This brings us to the question of the beard, particularly in the 1930s and 40s. Now, the beard eventually became a pressing question for Salafis, but not at first. Instead, between the 1930s and 1940s, Salafis were more concerned with questions of foreign influence and between 1950 and 1970, with the challenges of political repression posed by Abdel Nasser's secular nationalist regime. It is thus little surprise that Salafis during this period wore beards of widely varying lengths, including shorter than a fist. 
crucially for our understanding of Salafism and for the analytical frameworks that we consider to analyze it, there's nothing self-explanatory about the prophetic model for Salafis as it pertains to the beard other than the basic requirement to grow a beard. Now, to give one example, in May 1940, Ansar Asunna's founder, Muhammad Hamid al-Fikki, published an article that drew on a series of hadith narrations to explain the beard and mustache as two of the 10 characteristics of innate human nature, or fitra, that orients human beings to God. Al-Fikki emphasized that a beard constitutes an adornment of masculinity, zinat al-rujula, that makes it possible for Muslim men to distinguish themselves from both non-Muslim men and from Muslim women. While stipulating the centrality of the beard to masculinity, however, Asiki was vague as to its measurements, specifying that a man, quote, leave it so that it accumulates and grows plentiful. While Asiki regarded the cultivation of an Islamic beard as necessary and valuable, this practice did not distinguish Salafis from other Muslims, pious or impious, who grew the beard as, signal, as a means of signaling piety, masculinity, or both. Neither were the beards of Ansara Sunnah's leading members during this period necessarily distinct. The images from this period that we have of al fiqh and of a second prominent Ansara Sunnah figure, Abdul Rahman al wakil suggest facial hair far closer to the trimmed beard of Hassan al-Banna than that of his Salafi successors within Ansar Sunnah. And here you can see, here's al fiqh Here's Abdul Rahman al Wakil. Here's Hassan al Banna. These aren't substantial beards compared to Salafi beards today. Now, what's interesting in telling this story is that, in contrast to Ansar Sunnah, the Muslim Brotherhood's position on facial hair in the 1930s and 40s was already set. Hassan al Banna, as you just saw, sported a closely trimmed beard that identified him in a manner consistent with the Ascendia project as Islamic modern, to quote Gudrun Kramer. This approach would be reflected in the Brotherhood's magazine, Al-Ikhwan al-Muslimun, which featured the writings of Asayid Sebek. In a 15 July 1944 article, this graduate of Azhar and member of the Brotherhood explained, grow the beard out and let it accumulate so that it makes its wearer appear dignified. And one should not trim it to the point that it is closer to shave, that it's close to shaving, nor should one let it become indecent. Rather, moderation is the best, as it is in every matter. The 1950s and 1960s, by contrast, were a period during which wearing a beard exposed men to significant personal costs. And on Sarasana's wrote leaders wrote little about this topic during this period. This silence cannot be separated from the regime repression of the Brotherhood. Indeed, it was during this period that guards in the infamous military prison of Sijin al Harbi are reported to have shaved the heads and beards of imprisoned Muslim Brotherhoods, Muslim Brothers, excuse me, with some guards amusing themselves by shaving only a portion of prisoners' heads or beards. And in a May 1st, 1966 speech in the Delta textile town of Al Mahalla of Kobra, Abdel Nasser depicted Egypt's leading Islamist organization, the Muslim Brotherhood, as a foreign agent, stating, someone who grows out the beard comes to you and says that socialism is disbelief. Someone who claims that socialism opposes religion, which is to say Islam, is the person who will take the country's wealth for himself. Though such a claim was directed at the Brotherhood, it was not limited to them. And this brings us to the 1970s and the rule of Anwar al-Sadat following Abdel Nasser's death in 1970. Now, as Ansar Sunnah reconstitute itself, <clears throat> excuse me, in the early 1970s under Sadat's rule, it faced a striking visual challenge, one that you can see on your screen. The activists of the Jamia Islamia, the Islamic student movement, while some members of this movement eventually aligned themselves with Salafi organizations, other, others would display allegiance to the Brotherhood. Regardless of eventual allegiance, though, the men in this group displayed their substantial beards from Cairo to Alexandria to Asyut, 
Certain segments of the movement, particularly those in Upper Egypt, also distinguished themselves during this period by coercively fulfilling the duty to command right and forbid wrong. And here you can um, see an image of a Jama'a Islamia march for uh, to celebrate Eid um, in the late 1970s or early 1980s. <coughs> now, this association between bearded men and coercive practices was not limited to Egypt. Most notably in Saudi Arabia, Juhayman al Otebi led the Jama'a Salafiya Muhtasiba's attack on the Grand Mosque of Mecca in December of 1979 while sporting a long <clears throat> and bushy beard. <clears throat> Rejecting the religious legitimacy of the Saudi royal family and the political quietism of his mentor, Al Otebi and four to five hundred members of the Jamaat al Mustasiba killed hundreds of pilgrims and security forces alike before being subdued by a joint force that included um, Saudi National Guard <clears throat> and French and Pakistani commandos. The significance of these threats to Salafi scholars working within Saudi Arabia also lay in the Jamal Salafi Mustasiba's claim to Salafism. In January 1980, an interview with Salman bin Abdulaziz, then governor of Riyadh and the current king, um, noted that members of the Jamal Salafi Mustasiba are not, <coughs> excuse me one second. Not merely Kharijun al Adin, who have rejected the political order, but were also guilty of, quote, concealing themselves by claiming to represent Salafism. Hmm. Yet, while there is no Salafi beard during this time, we do get hints of the emergence of a logic of facial hair that Salafis would soon adopt. In 1979, the question of the beards, the question of the beards, particular specifications became a matter of official discussion in the, in the journal of the Islamic University of Medina. Ahmed Ali Taha al Riyan, an Egyptian graduate of Al Azhar, who had received his PhD from the university's Faculty of Sharia and Law in 1973, was about to conclude a four-year stint teaching at the Faculty of Noble Hadith at the Islamic University. In the first of two articles, the Salafi scholar set out three Hadith narrations regarding actions that constitute practices central to human nature. This is the Sunan al Fitra only one of which includes both growing a beard and trimming one's mustache. Now in the second article, Rayan explained the division between these jurists who argued, the jurists who argued that one can cut the beard if it exceeds the length of a fist, the kabda, or to the extent that it serves a man's distinguished bearing and those who reject any form of trimming the beard. For Rayan, the kabda or close to it is the measure on which one should rely. More broadly in here, we're gonna come back to my point about the linkage between ethics and visibility. The wearing a beard constitutes, quote, a prominent sign or announcement of masculinity, as well as a means of shaping sound behavior and of distinguishing Muslims from non-Muslims. For Al-Rayan, the beard communicated religious and gendered claims alike. Yet, notwithstanding al Rayan's series of articles, we have no evidence of a consensus among Salafis on the question of the fist as a minimal measurement in the early 1980s. So in 1982, in a pamphlet published in Syria, the Syrian Salafi Uthman bin Abdul Qadir Asafi says nothing about the length of the beard, while in a 1984 work, the Jordanian Salafi and student of leading Salafi scholar Muhammad Nasruddin al-Albani 
Ali al-Halabi states that the beard should stretch, quote, from the hair below the lower lip to the hair that grows under the chin. This trend extended to Saudi Arabia in a 1985 work, the Saudi scholar Hamoud al tuwajiri noted that the Prophet Muhammad had a thick beard, that he was cut al lahya Indeed, even Abdelaziz bin Baz did not mention this measurement in a 1983 ruling published in the Kuwaiti Islamist magazine, al mustama The fist was not yet standard among Salafis across the Middle East. Indeed, in a January 1986 fatwa, Ansar Sunnah President Muhammad Ali Abdul Rahim noted that it's forbidden to shave the beard, yet did not specify the extent to which one should trim it. During the mid 1980s, however, we do have a relatively junior voice in the Salafi movement, Muhammad bin Ismail al Muqaddam of the Alexandria based Dawa Salafiyah or Salafi Call who cited a series of hadith reports to define the question of whether the beard should be a minimum of one or two lengths. Kabda or Kabdatayn. According to Muqaddam, the most appropriate solution is that it not exceed a fist, the Kabda, in order to avoid excess. Apart from al-Muqaddam, however, Egyptian Salafis said little on this topic during this period. These debates, however, gained urgency because of Egypt's domestic conflicts, particularly the efforts of jihadi groups, some of which were Salafi, others of which were not, to target nightclubs, liquor stores, former government ministers, and journalists. And this brings us to a 1987 editorial in Ansar Asuna's mouthpiece, at tawhid in which the journal's editors vented their frustration that in the aftermath of incidents of terror and violence in Cairo, People have, quote, sought to make the population fear every bearded man, kol du lehya, accusing those who wear the beard and the long robe, the jilbab, of terrorism. So there's a problem here that they're facing, a visible problem, that everyone who wears the Salafi beard, is, or wears a long beard, is assumed to be engaged in jihad. Saudi Salafis also take note of this challenge during this period, specifically the challenge faced by their Egyptian counterparts. In a 1987 article in the Saudi journal Al Bayan, which is associated with the Saudi Sahwa movement, Mohammed Abdullah noted the increasing popularity of the beard and the long robe in Egypt and complained that proponents of jihad in Egypt were not necessarily Salafi. And to come back to the anecdote which I, with which I opened our talk today, in 1988, Ahmad Taha Nasser explained, the beard serves as a noble announcement to introduce society to what it means to be Sunni. It's also during this period that the beard comes to be seen increasingly as a non-negotiable condition of being Salafi. In an October 9, 1988 fatwa, a leading Salafi scholar, who we've mentioned before, Abdelaziz bin Baz, responded to an Egyptian student enrolled in the School of Maritime Transportation, in which students were required to shave. According to Ibn Baz, such a challenge was easily surmounted. We recommend, he wrote, that you enroll in a Saudi university, such as the Islamic University of Medina, or King Abdelaziz University in Jeddah, or Umm al Qura University in Mecca. We are ready to help you if you write to us with these details and send a copy of your qualifications and a letter which certifies your religious commitment from the president of Ansar al-Sunni al-Muhammadiyah, Muhammad Ali Abdul Rahim. By contrast, a second leading Saudi Salafi, Ibn al-Uthaymin, offered a more confrontational approach, arguing that if forced to shave, the entirety of the army's lower ranks should disobey their superiors and should instruct them that, quote, this sin, shaving the beard, is the reason for the failure and defeat of Arab armies. Here, their, their defeat to Israel. Yet, if Ibn Baz asked for the tazkiyah, the certification, and Muhammad Ali, from Muhammad Ali Abdul Rahim, and Ibn Uthaymin counseled resistance, Ansar Sunnah's leader himself had other ideas. In a January 1988 fatwa, Abdul Rahim noted 
that he'd received many letters regarding whether it was permissible to shave the beard, and that while growing a beard was indeed obligatory, such an obligation was not absolute. Specifically, in which in those instances in which the quote discord caused by growing the beard, and here the word for discord that uses fitna, is greater than that from shaving it, then shaving was permissible. So fitna as a justification for avoiding for avoiding social conflict around the beard and shaving the beard. Whatever the solution here, the dilemma for Egyptian Salafi men was very clear. So what should we make of this story? By the early 1990s, the consensus that a Salafi beard was distinguished by a trimmed mustache and a this length beard was established. Indeed, during the mid-1990s, Ibn Baz and Muhammad Nasr al-Din al had a heated argument on precisely this topic, with Ibn Baz insisting that one cannot trim beyond the fist in any circumstance, and al albani reporting that this prohibition was not only unfounded, but a case of additional innovation, uh, fighting words in Salafi circles. As you can tell, however, my interest in the story of the beard is not simply about chronology, when the fist becomes standard, but also what the story can teach us about Salafism's internal logic and its development as a social movement. How do, so put most broadly, how are we to understand Salafism's claim to replicate the golden model of the Prophet Muhammad? and his community in 7th century Arabia. Put differently, what does it mean to cite the past? How does such citation involve an active process of textual reconstruction and social transformation? And what are the assumptions that undergird such a project? While Salafi claims to continuity with the 7th century cast light on this movement's self-understanding, and this is certainly an important part of understanding Salafism, they tell us little about its origin or development. In this talk, and in my book more broadly, I show not only that Salafism is a project best understood within the ideological contestations of the 20th century, but also that it's defining logic in its social practices, specifically the emphasis on self-regulation and the linkage between ethics and communication through visibility are inextricably linked to and products of the emergence of powerful nation states and modern mass societies. Far from politicizing daily life, Salafism responds to this politicization by offering a distinctly modern ethic of communication. At the same time, though, such projects are often incomplete or ambiguous. As I argue in the book more broadly, multiple practices must be performed simultaneously precisely because a concern with individual practices of facial hair, shortened pants, or gender segregation is not exclusive to Salafism, and because practices that distinguish Salafis in one country may not serve this function in another. An emphasis on practice um, also reveals the material and perceptual conditions that have transformed Islamic scholarly reasoning in the 20th century, building on previous scholarship that dissects the subtle yet significant transformations of longstanding tools of fiqh, this book explores practices of citation as transmitted through Islamic print media and embodied by men and women in daily practice. My emphasis on Salafism as a practice, a project, excuse me, of historical reconstruction through an ostensibly straightforward textual approach also challenges the assumption, sometimes implicit and other times explicit, that contemporary Islamic piety movements rely on a model of embodied ethics that in its core logic is continuous with a discursive Islamic tradition that takes its cue from a pre-modern theological corpus. This approach, most prominent in the anthropological scholarship on Islam, valuably cast light on engagement with pre-modern religious texts. Yet, as the story of Salafi social practice reveals, citation of past authorities is not necessarily a historically continuous act. As I 
As such, I argue that contemporary forms of Islamic piety are shaped primarily by the communicative conditions of modernity and the social worlds of their participants, and only secondarily by a discursive Islamic ethical tradition. Finally, the story, this is a story of Islamic law that relies on media sources generally considered secondary, if not unimportant, to the study and development of this tradition. Previous studies that foreground landmark religious texts valuably illustrate the logic that defines these works and their relationship to previous interpretation. By complement, what I do here is I use periodicals, pamphlets, and to a lesser extent, lessons and lectures recorded by audio cassette to reveal the way in which contemporary media helps us understand the process by which significant legal rulings arise. Now, I've covered a lot already, so I'm gonna leave it here. I look forward to your questions and engagement and wish to thank Jonathan, Jonathan again for his lovely invitation and introduction. Let me unshare my screen. Let me just unshare my screen here. Uh, thanks very much. Um, that was really interesting, I've actually. <laughs> So it answers a lot of questions, or maybe it answers questions and, and, and makes and it raises questions too. Um, so if you have questions, folks, ask them in the Q&A box and I'll look at them, uh, hopefully. Um, so I had a few questions. One yeah. is, and this, and you may have answered this, I don't think you did, but if you did, then I'm just, you know, unable to receive information properly. But like, do you think that there's, could, could part of this be a kind of a, a, an indication of competition over who's the authorities in Egypt who's being heeded, the Egyptian Ansar Sunnah people or like Saudi authorities? Like, is, as, as you go through the 1980s, do you see like, diff, you know, could you say that, you know, people who are taking this off ramp are more heeding like kind of domestic Ansar Sunnah so authorities versus people who are um sticking with a big beard are more interested in the saudi authorities or is that no this is, no, this, is this is a key question of of the project this is why saudi arabia plays such a big role on certain issues it plays a bigger role than others um the issue the practice that really pivots on this egyptian saudi competition is gender segregation because in saudi arabia a salafi minority within a broader wahhabi hanbali majority finds inbuilt support for gender segregation um, in schools and workplaces that goes back to the 1960s. Um, and what, so one of, this is actually one of the most extraordinary things I discovered in, in this project. Um, so in this context, in the mid 1970s, this leading Saudi Salafi, Abdelaziz bin Baz works, he's writing in Ansar Sada's magazine to make a case for gender segregation. Um, and you know, as he's a, as he's a good Salafi, he needs to make a case that's a little bit different than the case that's being made in Saudi Arabia. Um, and in Saudi Arabia, that case goes back to the fatwas of Muhammad bin Ibrahim, you know, the doyen of the Saudi Wahhabi Hanbali religious establishment. But Muhammad bin Ibrahim can cite Maslaha, he can cite uh, the broader interests of the Muslim community, the threat of fitna. He can cite all these things as his core justification for why, and he does say all these things, for his core justification as to why gender mixing is not allowed and gender segregation is necessary. Ibn Baz can't do that. So Ibn Baz has to take the um, prohibition against what is has long understood to be flaunting, to barbarish, and understood to be female conduct, you know, modesty in, in clothing, modesty in voice, and so forth. His claim, and you know, I'll never forget, and you know, I nearly fell out of my chair when I first read this, his claim in a tawhid in the 1970s, his initial claim, is a tabaraj ma'anehu al-ikhtilat. Tabaraj means mixing. Because he needs a proof text from the Quran or Sunnah to undergird his project. Um, he eventually drops this because it's just not a, it's not a particularly persuasive textual claim. Um, but essentially what happens is it's not just that he drops this, but that gender segregation as a project doesn't actually work in Egypt. 
because Sal Salafis have neither a sympathetic audience in the state, nor do they have access to the levers of power. So ultimately, what happens in the Egyptian context, and this really distinguishes Egyptian Salafis here from Saudi Salafis, um, and basically involves them in many respects, um, ignoring Saudi Salafis, is they come to conceive of gender mixing not as a structural, or not, gender segregation not as a structural um, format, but rather as something one can do with one's own body um, through comportment, through adab. To take it a step further, some Egyptian Salafis even argue that there are permitted forms of mixing. There are forbidden and permitted forms. And this is in a book that comes out um, in around 2011 in Egypt. And the book basically um, includes a bunch of forewords in which various people are writing to praise it. But in one of the forewords, a Saudi Salafi gets really upset. He says, how can you say there's permitted and forbidden mixing? All of mixing is forbidden full stop. Um, but this is a case where very notably, the Saudis aren't calling the shots. Um, Egyptian Salafis are making the call, and they're making a call based not simply on um, textual arguments, but on social realities. But I wonder, you know, I wonder if they, um, to the extent that they created their own institutions and schools, if they yeah. created these like bubbles where they would have no gender mixing. Um, I, I want, you know, it reminds me of this uh, concept in the Naqshbandi Sufism of. Uh, uh, I think it's a Khalva Dar Anjaman, which is like solitariness in public. Like you go on mm -hmm. in just like almost like uh, your own little bu bubble yeah. in, pu in public. It's uh, it's almost like that's what the Egyptian Salafis like. You know, you sort of create your own segregated world uh, in like through your own conduct and how you act. Why why did uh, why did why was uh, Bin Baz unable to rely on arguments like Maslaha as, as, why was he not able to rely on the same arguments that Muhammad Ibn Ibrahim had relied on? Because it doesn't go back, because that argument doesn't, as a matter of proof text, go back to the Quran and Sunnah. And so yeah, it's, it's, not a, that he, it's not that he can't make argument. Argument. Sorry, what'd you say? Yeah, it's a Hanbali argument, not a Salafi yeah. argument. Um, so he basically, it's not that he can't make the argument. He makes versions of that argument in other contexts, but it's a weak argument for Salafis. Um, and so it doesn't do that much for him uh, in insofar as these debates over Salafi practice are really about Salafis coming at each other and citing loads of Hadith points. Um, and say, you know, to, to a lesser extent, citing verses from the Quran, but really, they're really premised on loads of Hadith reports, and he doesn't have that here. And that's a problem for him in terms of arguing for gender segregation. Okay, Joshua is asking, I wonder whether your emphasis on social practices are as applicable in earlier proponents of what is typically considered Salafism, for example, Rashid Rida and Hassan al-Banna. Do these figures also emphasize social practices that scholars have just overlooked? Or was there something about the 70s and 80s that necessitated codifying Salafism through social practices? Okay, so first thing I would say, um, I mean, I, I do think Henri's Lozier's work here on um, Salafism, you know, a grad, a grad of Georgetown, um, is really important here in bringing out the way in which Albanna and Rida really don't fit into the conceptual history of Salafism, um, the way the term is understood. Um, their approaches are very different. With Albanna, actually, there's a really interesting point here. And it's essentially about, um, this comes from a testimony of a um, member of the Muslim Sisters, in which she described encountering Albanna along with you know, a young Muslim brother who was basically going all out in his pursuit of piety, you know, a, you know, a stint, really clearly different clothing, um, a huge beard, just really looked distinctive. And Albana stopped him and said, our mission is not to look foreign or different, shahiban, from society. We need to look like the people. Um, and I think we see that in the fact that the brotherhood to a, 
a much more limited extent than Salafis adopts visual practices as central to what they're doing because they're not trying to distinguish themselves. Um, the second, sorry, just remind you, the second part of the question is about there's something particular about this, the competition. Yeah, there's something about the 70s and 80s where there's this sort of more of a need for a social kind of codification of social practices. Yeah, I think absolutely. I, this is happening in the context of a broader Islamic revival that is coursing through Egyptian society um, in which it's not just Muslim brothers and Salafis who are participating, but also state institutions, um, such as the Islamic Research Academy at Azhar, the, the Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs um, within the Ministry of Endowments. And so everyone is contesting social practice in some sense. Um, the state institutions are doing, through, doing so through institutions that they control, and the Islamic movements are doing so by seeking to reorient practice um, within state institutions. And Jonathan, this actually gets to a point you were making before, asking about whether there's this emergence of almost a Salafi bubble. And part of what to me is so interesting about Salafi social practices as they emerge, and here there's a parallel also to the brotherhood, is that I think that this idea of a bubble or in the study of Islamism, a parallel Islamic sector, to use Carrie Wickham's term, um, is overstated because these folks all had to go to school or work disproportionately within state institutions. And so essentially they had to adopt practices. The major vast majority of them had to adopt practices that lived with the reality that they were a minority, that they didn't have access to the levers of power. And that's part, and to come to this question about why social practice, that's part of what makes social practice such an incredibly useful move. Because it doesn't, it, all it requires is access to your body. It requires sovereignty over your body, nothing else. Now, that's not to say that a claim to your body and looking a certain way can't have costs. It sure can. Um, you know, one only has to think of the way in which having a bushy beard makes it more likely that you'll get picked up by state security forces. But it's a much more viable form of activism and changing society than access to the levers of power. Um, one per person is asking about, you know, to for better or for worse, these how the, these terms are used. Like, does this, does studying this, these social practices as ways of looking at authority and sources of authority, that help explain or cast light on the quote, oftentimes misinformed equation of Wahhabism and Salafism? So, like, my own spin on this question would be like, can you, if we were to think about Wahhabism and Salafism in this, this these would seem to be useful maybe ideas for what you're talking about. So there is a dispute among scholars of Salafism as to the relationship between Salafism and the Wahhabi Hanbali tradition. Um, now, part of this dispute is born out of the fact that they share a particular theological approach, you know, the uh, approach to God's, um, to the Asma and the Sifat, the names and the attributes. Um, but Wahhabi Hanbali scholars have a very different approach to fiqh, to law. Um, as, as we talked about in the case of Muhammad bin Ibrahim, as contrasted with Ibn Baz on the question of gender segregation. And so I, I see Saudi Arabia as essentially split between a majority Wahhabi Hanbali establishment and some very, very prominent minority Salafi voices. Um, to give an example of another individual who fits into this story, um, Abdul Razak uh, Al Afifi. Is the number two, he's number two in Ansar Sunnah behind Muhammad Hamid al Fiqh. In the mid 20th century, he moves to Saudi Arabia um, and he becomes one of the leading scholars behind the Ibn Baz in Saudi Arabia. Um, he is not a Wahhabi Hanbali, he, but there are certain pathways for Salafis in Saudi Arabia. So, yes, I think that a project like this helps us to think, to disentangle Salafism and Wahhabi Hanbalism. Um, and more broadly, to um, take seriously Saudi influence on Islamic reformism transnationally without ending up with in, of, in a story where what Saudi Arabia does determines what happens elsewhere. Because after all, Ansar Sinna has been around for 100 years. Jeff al Mohammed says, he's a, has a comment, it's interesting. I lived in Arabia on and off. I personally knew Bin Baz. And I've been to his houses in both Riyadh and Taif. I don't know. Um, and then he says he was considered the supreme religious authority in Saudi regime. 
So maybe Jeff can share. Uh, I don't know. I never met Ben Baz. I, Aaron, I take it you never met him either. No. Uh, I don't know. Any any anecdotes? Uh, was his house, uh, you know, how was it decorated? Did he have Did he uh, have good hors d'oeuvres? Uh, you know, I'm sure he was a good host. Any? We'll see if he gives us uh, any more anecdotes. Uh, in the meantime, are there any other? I have one other question, which is. Um, did, did you ever come across any interaction with kind of South Asian Deo Bundy discussions around beard length? Yes. So um, one of the really interesting things that happens, and this actually got cut out of the talk, I considered including it, is that Ibn Baz gets into um, talking about beard length, and specifically the length of the fist, um, by citing a work by a um, Giovanni scholar um, by the name of Kant Halawi. Um, it's a work that, you know, and, and this Kant Halawi had moved to Saudi Arabia and Ibn, and, you know, originally the book had been um, written in Urdu and it was translated into Arabic and in, Ibn Baz did a tahkik on it. He did this critical edition of it. Um, and this was the first, this happens in the late 70s. And this is really the first instance where Ibn Baz delves into the question of the fist as a minimum, minimal measurement. Um, now, you know, the Diobandi, a Diobandi discussion of a fist makes perfect sense because this is very much reflective of the broader um, Madhab tradition. Um, but we don't have evidence at this point, even as he published, he published a tahkik of this work and presumably supported its Arabic translation, we don't have evidence of him adopting the fist as his main measurement at this point. Interesting. Was that Muhammad Zakaria Kandahlawi? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Interesting, yeah. He's the uh, author of the ironically titled Aujaz al-Masalik, The Shortest Path to the to the Sharh of the Muatta, which is like the shortest path, but the book is like longer. <laughs> it's about eight <laughs> feet wide in terms of volume. Um, volumes. Um, okay, any, any other questions? This is your chance uh, to ask uh, an expert, all you Georgetown students out there. Otherwise, you're going to have to come ask me questions. I'm not going to know the answer to. <laughs> uh, let me see here. I don't see any more. I hope I'm not misusing this. But um, OK, well, I think uh, that's if you if you have more questions, folks, you can either email Dr. Rock Singer, or you can get his book and read it. It looks okay. like it's, uh, it looks like it'll be a really, uh, I'm looking forward to reading. It. Um, so okay. thanks very much for, for giving us a, you're sharing your expertise with us and your, your work. And hopefully I'll get to meet you in person soon. And we'll hear from you again soon. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks for having me.